Dr. Andrew Young at Santa Monica. And today we're going to talk about total knee replacement in a patient with a tibial nail. And this is mostly going to be a technical talk. Uh, we have a large audience. This is mostly for our healthcare professionals. But if you're a patient, you wanna watch and listen, you're welcome to do that too. But again, this will be more technical and mostly geared to healthcare professionals, medical students and residents. Okay, so this patient has developed a post-traumatic arthritis and is a former polytrauma patient with tibial shaft fracture, femoral shaft fracture, an IM tibial nail and a femoral nail. And now over time, the patient has gone on to develop degenerative changes in the right knee with associated valgus deformity, but there's also the retained hardware with the tibia, tibial nail. And so when we're looking at knee replacement, there are several specific considerations to be aware of. So the first is, how do does this hardware need to be removed? And if so, how do we remove it? The second is, what kind of implants can we use at the time of surgery? And then three, how can we position the implant should this implant be maintained? So for example, hardware removal. You'll have to know who manufactures this implant so that you have the extraction tools. And if they're no longer manufactured, to know whether or not you'll need the universal extraction device. You'll need to know how many screws there are approximately and how many screws there are distally. The second thing you want to know is, is this implant, this retained hardware, in the way of the tibial replacement part? Will it impinge? And you can do that at the time of surgery, or you can do that ahead of surgery. And I'll show you how we do that ahead of surgery. Next thing is you'll actually have to have a bank of different implants available so that should you maintain this implant, you'll be able to choose an implant that works around your existing tibial nail. And then you'll have to figure out how to position the implant so that it avoids the risk of impingement, impinging and malpositioning your tibial component. Okay, I'll show, so I'll show you what that looks like. The femoral part is straightforward. There's nothing up here. All of this will center around how we manage this interaction. There are a couple of things to consider. The first is how we get alignment in the tibia. And there are three ways to do that. Uh, the first two are involve manual instrumentation. And the third one requires a CT scan and works with robotic assist. So with manual instrumentation, there is intramedullary guidance to the tibia where you make a, a proximal hole in the tibia and then you send down an intramedullary rod. And that's a very accurate way to establish tibial alignment when you're putting in a tibial component. However, there's no way that you can do that with an existing nail. So if you were to choose that, the nail would have to come out. Um, the second way you could do it is with an extramedullary device where you attach proximally, you attach around the ankle, and then you estimate the position of the tibia in both the coronal and the sagittal panes and figure out slope. And that is a reasonable way to do that. Now that will allow you to make your tibial cut, but it won't allow you to understand your implant position in relation to this nail. The third way is to actually use a CT scan and robotic system. This is the way we do that because it allows us to plan for surgery before we're actually in the operating room. Okay, so here we are looking at a three-dimensional model of the femur. We're looking at a coronal, we're looking at axial, and we look at sagittal. And here we have the tibia, coronal, axial, and sagittally. And then we can virtually position our implants so we understand where they would go in relation to this nail. And so when we look at our initial planning stages, here I can see that this implant is behind the nail. So we've taken a cross-section behind the nail. And when I look actually, I can see I can position the tibial implant so it's just behind the nail. And that's why we don't see it in this view. It's just behind the nail. But when I look at it from the side, I can also see we're going to run into a problem because this tibial keel and stem will run right into the nail. So if I were to look at this, I'd say I'd have to either take the nail out, change the position of the implant, or change the implant itself, or maybe do all three. Okay, so I know that I won't be able to get this tibia in with this implant in this position with the existing nail. So we have to start making some adjustments. And ideally you wanna do this all prior to surgery. Okay, so we look at four different things when we're looking at the preoperative planning. One, we look at the tibial sizing and positioning. We look at the resection depth of the tibial cut, the tibial slope, as well as the type of implant that we will use for fixation in the metaphysis. So the first thing is tibial sizing and positioning. So we know the nail is about here. 
and so what we can do is we can choose one side down that still gives us sufficient coverage, but allows us to shift it more posterior. So I can use one size down and that allows me to shift it posterior because the nail in the sagittal plane is more anterior. So that's the first thing that you can do. Uh, the second thing you can do is you can modify your resection depth. And so we typically take seven to eight millimeters because the seven millimeters plus two millimeters of cartilage is nine millimeters. And that's the composite of the polyethylene and the tibial component. So we'll start around eight and we'll see where that takes us. You can see we're just hitting the tibial nail. The third thing that we can do is we can adjust the slope. For, so for, more, for most cruciate retaining or cruciate substituting devices, we wanna be at about three degrees of slope. Uh, but we can see at three degrees of slope, we're impinging. And then the third thing is we can look at the depth of this implant and how far it goes down. So we'll start making some changes. First change we'll make, relatively straightforward, we'll downsize our implant, shift it posteriorly. That moves us back away from the nail. The next thing is that we'll start making subtle adjustments to the tibial component position prior to surgery to avoid this so that ideally we can retain the nail. We can always take the nail out, but this nail has been in for decades and is buried and you just can't take the nail out. You have to go into the ankle and take out all the locking screws and you have to go in the metaphysis, take out this. So if we can work around the nail, then we can preserve all the bone and not traumatize the leg any further. So it's worth keeping the nail if possible. If you can't, it has to come out, but if you can work around it, then it, it's actually a win. So the first thing that we'll do after we've moved it back is we'll see if we can adjust our slope. So if I take one degree off the slope, if I go from three to two degrees, I can see now that this point right there is no longer touching. So you can see there's overlap here. And if I just change the angle by one degree, I can shift it more posteriorly so it's no longer impinging along the posterior aspect of the intramedullary nail. Okay, so that's the first thing that I do. Next thing I do is I'll look at my options for the tibial base plate. Now within this system, there are three options. There's a universal, there's a classic, and there's a low profile. So a typical universal option shows that I have this keel here. This is the keel, and then this is the intramedullary uh, extension. So the extension hits the nail, but I can also see this top part of the keel or the bottom part of the keel hits the nail. So what I can do is I can use one that doesn't have this intramedullary extension, and I can also use a low profile one. The low profile is actually four millimeters shorter at the keel than the universal base plate. So that gets me to the top of these crosshairs. So the keel height is a four millimeter difference. And now you can see at four millimeters above, I'm no longer touching the nail. So if I put it in this exact position of two degree slope, I've shifted a little bit posteriorly, I've downsized, and then I use a low profile keel. Now I can see I'm no longer touching the nail. And then because of this, I don't have to go through either a two-stage procedure where a patient comes in, I take the nail out, and then once they heal, we do it again, or I don't have to take it out the same setting. So I'm able to work around this implant by making these adjustments in implant choice, implant position, and implant slope. And then the, the final thing that we have to do is once we've determined resection depth, anterior posterior position in a coronal plane, the sizing, uh, we always still have to pay attention to rotation to make sure that we have proper patella tracking and mating with the femoral component. We'll set that to zero degrees in relation to the third of the tibial tubercle. Okay, and then, so this is what it looks like. So the femur, again, we said is relatively straightforward. We can see that we've been able to maintain the nail. The coronal plane was relatively straightforward to manage. Everything was going to be a problem in the sagittal plane. And you can see, instead of a three degree slope, we have a two degree slope. And then instead of using this keel that would have come down here, we used a low profile keel. And that allows us to avoid hitting the implant, which might push us into a malposition. Okay. So here we are at nine weeks follow up or two months after surgery, uh, she's walking. She has good range of motion, good stability, and she's able to flex her knee. And we've been able to avoid getting into her ankle and then getting into the proximal tibia with screw removal. Okay. So again, there are many ways to deal with a retained tibial intramedullary nail. Uh, the traditional way has been either a one or two stage uh, surgery with 
associated removal of the nail. And that way you don't have to worry about implant choice or implant positioning, but it does present secondary changes with the additional burden of surgery on the patient. Um, a more recent way to do this is to actually do preoperative planning and make adjustments to tibial position, tibial resection depth, tibial uh, slope, so that you will be able to potentially remove, uh, retain the tibial nail rather than remove it altogether. Thank you very much.